as it was said at the beginning of this day, this uh, the Through the Fog project. So this is the simple uh, website that we have uh, for uh, this project. So as it was uh, said at the beginning, this is one of these uh, PRA uh, basic research project funded by our university. They have a duration of one year. Our project was, uh, as at this point of the day, you probably know, uh, contained the fog computing in the title. So the ambitious name we gave uh, for the submission was Through the Fog. And I think we were brave enough because to submit a basic uh, research proposal and use as a title Through the Fog was uh, sounding a bit foggy as a proposal, but fortunately it was funded. And uh, as I was saying in the beginning, and it was also said by our rector, um, the idea of these projects is that they are not, they're rather different from a European project or for other uh, industry uh, university projects. So basically are different, uh, there are different groups of, the, 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 of our department that uh, join together on a new topic. So this is how we started basically. So we had the different people from high performance computing, for algorithms, from formal uh, methods and formal models, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the, I'm saying this because uh, the amount of funding uh, for us, uh, uh, I mean, we were all positively impressed that our university decided, uh, decided to fund basic research. But, but this is, of course, uh, incomparable with a European project as, uh, I mean, uh, kind of uh, possibility of uh, funding personnel and, and all the rest. So our activity, we spent the first part of the project uh, where each group and each member, we tried to understand uh, how, what we were doing and what we were planning as our immediate research was applied or could be applied or was related to fog compute to different uh, challenges of fog computing. And in particular, we tried to identify three different angles. So one was, let's say, from the top, how can we deploy application on top of a fog infrastructures? The second was how can we program or how can we help people to program new applications for the FOG, including uh, specification models, high level uh, linguistic constructs and so on. And the third, as you can imagine, is what kind of techniques can we develop for supporting <coughs> the FOG computing part? Of course, all these three uh, top uh, angles are very general views. Now. Uh, what we uh, concluded in this year, here I have a list uh, of all the people, uh, uh, faculty members and other members that participated in the project. So we basically uh, produced uh, uh, around uh, 50 publications from the different groups. That uh, they are, some of them were specifically on the FOG. Uh, most of them were on uh, issues or uh, fundament foundational aspects which can relate or can be applied in the fog. We organized the two workshops. This is the second workshop. We had uh, uh, another workshop at the beginning of the project. And we also had some uh, concrete uh, prototypes that emerged from this research. And the two of them are listed here. So the names are Fog Torch Pi and IOX, although IOX is probably overloaded by a competitor Cisco. Cisco, I mean, use this name later, but it's a Cisco still, so, I, okay, <laughs> bad luck. So uh, what, uh, I mean, this, the, you can find the website for, but the information is basically what I showed you that you can find there. So our idea was now to shortly present you these two different uh, uh, prototypes so that we can, uh, we have this opportunity of sharing with you what are two of the concrete results. So we start with uh, 
Fog, uh, Stefan got to sleep, but we start with, uh, sorry for my long introduction, uh, Fog Torch Pie. Please, Stefan. So, in the next, like, 20 minutes, I will try to give you a dash of what Fog Torch Pie is. It's our last work. It has been accepted to ICFEC 2017, and then at that link you could find uh, the first draft. Um, Throughout the morning and the afternoon, we have seen this need for uh, fog nodes. Fog nodes that will filter data from 50 billion of connected devices. This is an estimate by Cisco. And the cloud alone cannot support this momentum. So filtering and processing before the cloud becomes a very important moment in uh, big data analysis. And the fog feature are these ones, basically this QS awareness in the sense that deployments should uh, try to adapt to network conditions and should try to guarantee some QS constraints. Then location awareness, data is processed where near where it is produced. And finally, context awareness. And the fog nodes should be able to discover each other and to cooperate, as we have seen with Maria this morning, horizontally also, not only vertically, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. I will try to be as light as possible, even if our work funds on a formal model, I will try to avoid to go into details. So I start from a motivating example. Suppose this is an um, application, a multi-component application for irrigating fields. It's a very simple one. We have a water and the moisture, a water, um, sorry. We have um, a water sprinkler and the moisture, a soil moisture sensor. And then the app is also capable of uh, seeing if there's a fire, if there's a fire hazard, and tell it to the um, farmer. And finally, there's video streaming from the fields, which is something very important, because uh, maybe the farmer is, has a very big, an uh, sort of intensive um, farm, and he wants to control his crops. And then there's the cloud many sensors and actuators installed, and three fog nodes. Okay, each of these two, the farmer bought, it, bought them. The IT experts at the farm told him he should buy them and install one uh, in the fields, and the other one <coughs> in the um, uh, storage room. And then there's a consortium node which is shared among different farms in the area, and which can be used by all of them. But of course, this is a, at a greater expense. They should pay for the consortium node. And all of these have a connection. Of course, the, let's say the consortium node has a very good connex connection. It's a VDSL. The node is installed in the crops as a 4G connection, a mobile one. And the last node, the one in the storage uh, facility of the farm, it has a satellite connection. And with the due respect for telecom operators, uh, connections are not fixed. QoS vary over time, vary over time. So uh, each of these connections cannot actually guarantee the same latency and bandwidth at all the time during the day. What happened here? This is Cortana. There are open problems then. How can I automatically algorithmically decide where to deploy each component along the continuum from cloud to things, and adaptively do, do this maybe. Because uh, maybe um, long-term uh, business uh, uh, strategies may collapse nearer to the fog layer or go to the cloud, depending on the network conditions. And also, how can I get an estimate of the compliance that my deployment will have with the requirements in terms of QoS that I have? This is the question we try to answer. So, for our example, is there any deployment that complies most with my QoS needs with respect to others? Is it possible to reduce resource consumption, for example, on the shared fog node for which I have to pay? Or do I have to upgrade my infrastructure if the application requirements change? Say, I change my SD video camera in the crops with a very good 4K one or with an HD one, then would, what, what, what should I do? Should I buy 
a new contract with my telecom provider. And this is Foctorch Pi. Basically, it inputs the description of an infrastructure with probabilities for the QS requirements, which, as I said, may vary. Uh, an application with deployment policies and things binding. I'll go through them in a moment. And it uses a Monte Carlo simulation to estimate the, res the QS assurance of each the general possible uh, candidate deployment. And it estimates the resource consumption on a given set of nodes, which may be all the nodes or some of them, depending on, on our interest. The QS profile we consider for now uh, take into account latency and bandwidth, both upload and download bandwidth, because sensors sometimes should also receive data to act. The actuators who should receive data to act. So in our model, the application we have seen before looks like this. Each component is associated with its software and hardware requirements. And interactions between components are, associ are associated with a QS profile, which in this case, for example, for the SD video, it's 160 milliseconds, 0 0.5 megabit per second, download uh, and 0 0.7 upload. <clears throat> and also components may exploit things and also things should be accessible with um, their a proper QS profile and things can be accessed from different nodes. So say nodes, fog node A is connected to the video camera, also fog node B if it uh, um, if a component that needs a video camera is installed at that node, should be able to access that thing. And we account for this in our model. Analogously for the infrastructure, we have the two cloud providers, the farm selected, we have the three FOG nodes, and we have the actual things. And profiles. QS profiles here are probabilistic. 98% of the cases, our satellite 7 megabit connection gets connected to the internet with this profile, but there is a 2% of the case we, where we cannot connect, where we have disruption. These are actual data taken from uh, the National Agency for Telecommunications. Whereas for FOG nodes, which sometimes can feature a limited amount of uh, hardware resources, we consider the hardware. For the cloud, we, we did this consist big assumption that um, hardware can be considered unbounded which is true if we consider that we can always pay more and get more virtual instances. Deployment policies. <clears throat> a startup sponsored by a specific cloud provider may want to exploit the cloud of its sponsor. Or an automated industrial plant may want the secret recipe of its uh, control loops to be installed on the on-premise node and not to go on the cloud. And finally, an invoked third-party service cannot be moved from where it is deployed. We account for this, and we allow the specification of whitelist or nodes of nodes allowed for deployment. And finally, there's the thing binding, which is the last ingredient. If I want to exploit my um, sprinkler, I don't want it to be my neighbor's one. So when I specify my application, I also input in FogTorch to which water sensor I want to connect mine in this case. What is an eligible deployment then in this simple model? It is a deployment that is satisfy compatibility and deployment policy policies. I cannot install a component to a no onto a node which doesn't have the right uh, software and other requirements. Does not exceed the hardware capacity at each FOG node in the sense that if I match, map more than one component onto the same node, I don't want it to get overloaded. If I have uh, four giga RAM and my, my components both need four giga, I cannot deploy both of them there. Satisfy the things request that we have seen with the proper QoS and does not exceed the available links bandwidth. Because as for the um, hardware capacity of VOG nodes, links bandwidth is limited. I cannot map a 20 mega requirements or a seven megabit per second link. We use a backtracking strategy to explore the whole search space, which unfortunately, as uh, Valeria said before, these kind of problems are all NP-hard. 
So it's exponential. Complexity of our backtracking algorithm is exponential. We try all the possibilities, and we prove this by reduction from the subgraph isomorphism problem. But the Monte Carlo simulator uh, turned out to be quite fast on this small instance. So it, uh, we repeat a sufficiently number, large number of times the experiment. Um, it was 100,000 in, uh, in this case. And we sample, at each time we sample a QS profile for each link. So we simulate variations over time. And then we run the backtracking algorithm over the obtained infrastructure. And what we get is the answer to the question we had at the beginning. Fogtorch outputs deployments this way for each component. It tells us where it should go. And uh, we name deployment by delta. So this was the first question. Which are the eligible deployments that comply most with the required QS? Here we leave to the trade-off uh, to the IT experts. Because we cannot say that, suppose this, this, it's very important, there's a, a, hu a high risk of fire hazard. At that farm, we want 100% QS compliance. And we maybe are also, um, okay if we consume more fog resources. But if we are fine with a 98% QS assurance, then we may, we may want to exploit one of these four deployments, simply because we consume less resources in the fog layer. Second question that we had, is it possible to reduce resource consumption of fo some fog nodes or avoid to exploit them? We enforce this by business constraint. In this case, we say we don't want to use the consortium node. And yes, we can, and we can actually achieve the same QS assurance as before. And the third question was, do I have to upgrade my infrastructure if the application requirements change? In this case, we actually try to deploy HD video streaming, which changes the requirements we had before for the video camera. And from here, we see that QS assurance drastically reduces, right? Uh, so yes, it would be possible, but we won't get not even 95% of compliance with our requirements. So we should evaluate possible upgrades to our infrastructure. For example, we may want to upgrade our 7 MB connection, satellite connection with a 14 MB connection and compare this with another possible upgrade from 3G to 4G of the, other of the fog node in the fields. And here we, we clearly see that the winner among these two upgrades is the 14 Mbps upgrade because it reaches 96% with deployment 21 and 22, whereas here we always say around 90 for what concerns QS assurance. Again, for what concerns fog resource consumption, actually here we have an an optimum also for that because uh, this cluster of deployments is optimal both for what concerns the resource consumption and the, and the QS assurance. But the final decision will be for IT experts at the farm. And this is what FogTorch does in three points. It can be used, it's a simulator so you don't have to buy any stuff and to implement anything. You just run it maybe before your first deployment to understand if it's feasible as well. You simulate and compare the infrared fog scenarios at design time, and you can determine the QOS um, assurance of deployments. We take into account processing and QS constraints, and we estimate the QS assurance by probability distributions, which by now are very simple because we have the data uh, from the, the public data from the AGCOM, but in future, in fog scenarios, maybe also operators will be available to disclose uh, better data. And our future work will uh, mainly go through towards three directions. We would like to add new QoS attributes to have a, a, fairly, a more realistic um, model of the fog infrastructure and cost information, pricing. For different stakeholders, how much does it cost to deploy an application? Then we would like to insert multiple and multi-tenant deployments in the tool and testing on real case studies also to study if we can prune the better prune the search space with heuristics and avoid the uh, really high complexity that our algorithm features at the moment. Thank you for the attention. I'm available to answer some questions. 
Nice, nice work. I guess I, I, I will contact you offline as, as in some work we, we have right now would need, would benefit a lot from these kind of things. So I'm pretty sure that we can find a way to, to, to discuss a bit after. Um, my question uh, to you now is uh, um, among the, the possible direction in the uh, future work of your contribution, uh, are you envisioning the possibility of considering in a separate uh, perspective data and the computation? I mean, uh, as you know, a configuration of computation or data uh, are not the same and may impact uh, very in a very different way the infrastructure. So do you think that it w could make sense to treat even this, this possibility? Thank you both for the offer to cooperate and for the question. It's a fairly interesting and difficult one, actually, because we tried at the beginning to put some data into account in the model, but then with the first attempts, it would have complicated much more the, the model. Everything is designed so to ask the less as possible as the, to the users. Like the infrastructure can be given by providers, by people who have to sell the product, but I don't want to, to uh, like describe too much in detail the application. This was our goal, to keep it simple. But definitely if we, find, if we would find a way to uh, also consider data, take data into account in the model, uh, without burdening people that have to give us this piece of information, that would be, that would make the model far more realistic and make this really interesting, I guess. So, thanks for the cue. So, uh, I will try to be uh, short, uh, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, runtime uh, we uh, started developing before the project started. And it was natural to 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 found a place uh, in the in the font context. Uh, and the idea of this uh, IOX is to build a runtime, essentially for uh, uh, simplify the communication among uh, uh, Internet of Things uh, devices. Uh, what seems uh, to be part of the fog. Uh, um, uh, architecture is essentially the, 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 the existence of these uh, fog nodes, which are essentially um, elements uh, in the communication infrastructure uh, of a very distributed system where devices uh, become uh, nodes, not anymore servers or desktops, but uh, sensors uh, and actuators. And the uh, responsibility is uh, uh, to provide uh, functions uh, that are not typical of the pure computing we are used to because uh, we have uh, latency that was mentioned uh, before and, uh, and barrier and security. And uh, we need to, to have uh, not just the, uh, uh, the primitive uh, to deliver messages from one side to the other of the network, but uh, being able to predicate how to handle these messages because uh, if you can alter uh, a message, you can uh, now disrupt some part of the physical, physical world uh, by making some car crash or whatever. So there are uh, a number of uh, issues that, uh, tied to the communication process. So IOX uh, uh, started as a, um, uh, a way to provide a vendor agnostic uh, uh, runtime uh, for uh, developing uh, Internet of Things application uh, based on uh, HTTP, REST, and JSON, uh, which are already becoming dominant in the Internet of Things uh, as a way in the microservice fabric uh, as a um, basic standard protocol to have uh, uh, communication. And uh, it's uh, mostly message based. So, uh, uh, JSON is uh, a way to define uh, dynamically uh, objects. And, and this essentially, if you think, it's uh, a form of, uh, uh, so to speak, level seven uh, uh, semantic routing. So it's a, uh, actually, we need uh, uh, a way to uh, take messages that have a flexible format, uh, JSON, and we need a way to take these uh, messages uh, and store and forward them. So we, have a, uh, we need a, a way to store potentially on, on a storage uh, some messages coming uh, from some device uh, or 
end, uh, forward the message to another layer, which is one of the essence of the fog computing. Um, and uh, on, on, uh, uh, on our goal, uh, it was, uh, uh, there was an additional requirement. It was uh, the ability to uh, be capable of inspecting the messages uh, uh, that are generated uh, and uh, uh, forwarded by modules uh, inside the runtime. So uh, the idea is uh, essentially to induce an, arch an architecture that is very similar to the, uh, the one that is described by the fog, uh, where you have uh, several devices uh, and you have uh, the uh, IOX runtime running uh, uh, on those devices. And uh, the IOX runtime is meant for essentially uh, uh, generate messages, receiving and uh, forwarding messages according to well-defined policies. And these policies uh, are uh, defined by modules that uh, in this uh, schema uh, are identified by MN and MN2. So essentially the runtime provides a number of facilities uh, for developing these modules, uh, but at the same time uh, operates as a sort uh, of local bus inside the device. Uh, where the user, as you can see by the uh, user uh, yellow part, uh, it should be capable to hook into the message processing uh, pipeline so that you can uh, have uh, uh, policies that are not modules, so vendor specific, but are user specific, so that you can predicate something like, uh, I don't, don't want them, uh, uh, the, uh, any sensible information leaving my organization and I want to be sure even if I install uh, some module from some vendors that this uh, holds true. So that's uh, uh, the basic uh, uh, idea. Uh, we use the uh, .NET uh, as a uh, runtime for implementing uh, the runtime and we use the uh, uh, PhD work based on uh, event-based programming, reactive programming uh, for building uh, uh, um, programming abstraction to simplify uh, the, the, the defilement. I don't want to go into this uh, uh, piece of code, but uh, the, the basic idea is that you, you should be able to register endpoint uh, uh, using uh, uh, URLs, essentially, that corresponds to the endpoints that will receive the messages. And then uh, you have uh, the ability to uh, define uh, the, the uh, control flow of the, of the node uh, using uh, um, uh, uh, network uh, of, uh, that is uh, powered, it's a Petri net uh, that uh, gets uh, uh, feeded by events. Uh, and so uh, the state of the network uh, get uh, changes as long uh, as the system receive events from the, end, the endpoints. Uh, we started uh, with a very local demo here in the department for opening uh, a door, uh, so it was really IoT, so uh, uh, the local device recognizes uh, uh, the, the fingerprint, uh, then sends uh, a message to a switch, and that was uh, part of an uh, interesting part. We used uh, uh, a switch, uh, a data center switch, uh, for running the runtime, because now in the uh, open networking world, uh, you have access to the operating system running on the control plane, so you can run uh, the runtime inside the, the network switch. And uh, uh, the network switch was uh, uh, in charge to decide whether to or not to accept uh, uh, the opening of the door. And then uh, you log and uh, potentially open the door. So that was the first uh, uh, example uh, we set up. Uh, then we moved on and uh, uh, at the first workshop of this uh, project, uh, uh, there was a talk about uh, a form uh, of distributed programming called uh, uh, aggregate programming uh, proposed by uh, Viroy uh, and other people. And uh, uh, it's a form of programming where you define an algorithm and not uh, thinking of a single device that should explicitly coordinate with others, uh, but you define the algorithms using uh, specific primitives that allows the information to propagate uh, 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 inside a network, uh, but you write a single source and you have a specific prim primitives uh, to, to have some guarantees uh, about the uh, properties of the algorithms. And uh, we, uh, it was interesting for us because actually uh, HTTP is a server, service based protocol. So uh, the limit uh, could have been uh, uh, how to implement broadcast based communication. 
And so we uh, simulated uh, to a reasonable level uh, the uh, broadcast communication uh, by having specific node uh, and a few assumption. And, uh, and we implemented uh, uh, the, the, the field calculus, which is, based, uh, uh, is the basis for the aggregate programming uh, on top of the IOX. And that was uh, to validate uh, that it was possible uh, to implement also non-standard HTTP communication on top of the runtime. Um, probably more interesting, uh, we uh, started a collaboration uh, with uh, a vendor that uh, produces uh, firewalls, firewall appliances, and uh, uh, we uh, started, the, actually it's in test phase, uh, the deployment should start shortly, uh, in the World Food Program, which is an organization uh, based in Rome, uh, where actually uh, they have this problem. They have uh, uh, 400 locations worldwide uh, where they have firewalls uh, and they need to aggregate uh, all the information uh, uh, in the logs. Uh, but actually the syslog, uh, which is the mechanism they use uh, to uh, generate the logs, uh, uh, are too big in some cases, given the satellite connection and bandwidth they have spe uh, in special countries such as Africa. Uh, and actually, uh, for them it's important to monitor uh, the, the logs from the firewalls because uh, uh, some employees uh, uh, have the habit to unplug the firewall and bypass it. Uh, for having access to internet uh, uh, in countries where access is very limited to. Uh, and uh, uh, so for them, it was critical uh, to, to be able to, to bring the, the logs uh, in Rome, actually. So uh, in uh, four days, no, probably less, uh, including the debugging, we developed uh, essentially a bridge based on the IOX, uh, transforming the firewalls uh, uh, into IoT devices. Uh, which receives uh, the syslog messages locally, compress them, uh, produce a, lo uh, uh, a compressed form that uh, filters them, which is one of the essence of the fog. So actually not all messages get forwarded to Rome because some, some are useless essentially, and, uh, and get stored on the, on the local disk uh, of, the, uh, of the office. Uh, others get forwarded to Rome uh, and get pro processed uh, in, uh, by a software that uh, sees, uh, uh, sees log messages because uh, the node uh, that is uh, at WFP essentially is, uh, uncompress the logs and replace as UDP packets uh, as the standards. Uh, so it's essentially a form of tunnel. Uh, the interesting part is it was that uh, it was a very small module uh, that actually uh, reduced the network traffic by 95%. So actually it was uh, successful. So now they are in testing and uh, this will be deployed, uh, I hope, very soon. Um, so um, in uh, conclusion, uh, we still believe after uh, this uh, experience that uh, HTTP REST and JSON will be probably uh, the main part of the uh, semantic routing we need for messages uh, in, in, the, in the fog. Uh, IOX, uh, at the end of the day is a way to simplify the implementation uh, of the uh, message passing uh, you need. Uh, and it's capable of going from a network switch uh, down to the I an IoT device uh, up to a server. So it's uh, very flexible, it's very small. Um, and actually we started uh, investigating how to uh, sort of automate uh, uh, the fog node implementation. I mean, uh, uh, so that it's easy to use it as a potential uh, runtime for uh, uh, implementing uh, fog nodes. Uh, repo is available on GitHub, uh, and if you're interested, those are the coordinates. So. Have you looked at this uh, new protocol for uh, small device, COEP, as a uh, native, the multicast broadcast way, because it's using uh, UDP in a rapid way. Yes, uh, the, 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 it's not the only one. There is also the MQTT and uh, a number of uh, additional protocols. Uh, uh, um, in my personal opinion, uh, that is uh, uh, 
something that you want to probably want to keep uh, in the local and the fog nodes uh, should be responsible to adapt this kind of flow in a more standard way of doing things because uh, UDP is a protocol you can uh, support uh, uh, locally but it's uh, uh, unlikely to go through firewalls and uh, so actually we are focusing on that and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the syslog uh, uh, example was in, of this kind. I mean, uh, the module was responsible of uh, having uh, the UDP receiver compress, uh, convert the message into JSON and HTTP, and then uh, uh, revert the... It's not clear to me why we need to use a broadcast. Oh, broadcast. oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, in the aggregate programming, yeah, I missed that. Uh, in the aggregate programming model, uh, you need a broadcast uh, to implement uh, a specific operation uh, in the cut. Yeah, in the, but that's, that was uh, our attempt to implement uh, uh, a runtime and a programming language that uh, was implying the broadcast operation. I comment was related to this. Okay, sorry. Actually, I, I introduced uh, this uh, last session by saying we will have uh, two demos, and they were instead the presentation, but uh, you can find uh, the links to the GitHub. The, the prototypes exist, even if uh, 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 they were not uh, demoed today. Let me just conclude by thanking all, all uh, the participants uh, for being here today, and uh, most importantly, also all the speakers who kindly accepted to come uh, to PISA for this talk. Uh, this is my opportunity also to thank all uh, my colleagues uh, who uh, stayed in the project and bared uh, with my coordination uh, for the one year. Uh, thanks also for the technical support by our university for uh, um, recording uh, today to our uh, department administration who was very supportive with all the logistics and to also to the people of my group that uh, helped a lot uh, in this organization, even uh, yesterday night after dinner, so in particular Emma and uh, Stefano, thank you very much.